I'll stop my essential units, it's the Sancho Man here, so it's been months since I reviewed a WCW pay-per-view. The last WCW pay-per-view I reviewed on this channel was Halloween Havoc 1997. So in this video I'm reviewing WCW Super Brawl 8 at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, California on the 22nd of February 1998. The attendance for the show was 12,620. This show received about 415,000 pay-per-view buys. This is WCW in 1998, you know, during their whole boom period for the company. The World Wrestling Federation, they're still in the middle of the road to WrestleMania 14. They're not quite there yet, catching up with WCW. I think they'll catch up with WCW at the really in the autumn of 1998 basically later on in the year you know you, you got like WrestleMania 14 the main event you know Michaels Austin for the World, World Wrestling Federation Championship with um, Mike Tyson as the special guest enforcer and then Raw breaking the 83 streak of Nitro and then and then the momentum cracked up with the whole McMahon Austin rivalry and the highway to hell. Anyway, so this show, yeah, by the way, last year I reviewed Sold Out 98. I thought that was the aftermath show to Starcade 97. Unfortunately, that's not really the case. And speaking of Starcade 97, so in the main event. Of Star K97, you had Hollywood Hogan versus Sting for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. They tried to do their version of the Montreal Screwjob with the NWO referee Nick Patrick. Instead of doing the fast free count, he did a normal free count. That kind of kiboshed the 18 month build. Um, we had Sting defeat Hogan on that show. You had uh, Bret Hart, you know, you know, came out, attacked Nick Patrick, did the um, referee. You know, that was just, I don't want to get, that's another story for another time. If it, you know, I might review Starcade um, 97 at the end of the year. Anyway, so, so yeah, Sting was the champion then on the first episode of Thunder. Sting, um, yeah, the, um, at the time they were doing the whole free uh, authority figures in WCW. You had J.J. Uh, Dillon, who's basically um, represent the committee of WCW. Um, and then you got Eric Bischoff, who's the president of WCW at the time, in kayfabe. I think his real title in WCW at the time was the Vice, was a Vice exclusive, I think it was a Vice producer of WCW, I'm not too sure. And then you got Roddy Piper, um, they added him as another authority figure for no reason, he was like the commissioner of WCW, so, so yeah, on the first episode of Thunder, J.J. Dillon stripped uh, stri uh, Sting off the world title. Yeah, Sting relinquished the world heavyweight title. Then at sold out, Piper announced that the main event of this show, Super Bowl VIII, that um, we're going to crown the new world heavyweight champion. It was basically a rematch from Star Trek 97, Hogan versus Sting. So, anyway, uh, yeah, the commentators for the show are Tony Schiavone, Bobby the Brain Heenan, and Mike Tenay on commentary. Anyway, so, uh, by the way, before we get to the rest of the, sh the um, review, we need a drink before it's a bit dry. <sighs> drink more water, by the way. So, yeah, before we get to the rest of the matches on the show, there was one match. It was originally going to take place on this show. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. It was a match between... Larry Sabisco versus Louis Spicoli. Um, I've done my research on Spicoli before I'm, you know, you know, trying to re record this review of uh, Super Bowl Eight. Um, not familiar of Louis Spicoli. Yeah, I looked him up. He had a, a run in ECW. I think he feud with Tommy Dreamer. I think he is the inventor of the Spicoli Driver, aka the Death Valley Driver. In WCW, he was in the middle of. The whole Larry Sabisco, Larry Scott Hall, NWO feud. You know, he was Scott Hall's lackey. He was getting into Sabisco's face. I think he like stole Sabisco's golf clubs, breaking them in the process. So, and you know, the match between 
Sabisco and Sp Spicoli. It was supposed to be Young versus Old. Unfortunately, uh, Spicoli had a relapse, you know. I found on Wikipedia, you know, b before I record this review of the show, um, he had a relapse because his, his mom, I think he died or was terminally ill of cancer, so he mixed wine with a drug, a drug called Soma, I think it's called. And he sadly died, he choked on his vomit while he was asleep, and then you know, the, the, the commerce of Los Angeles, I think, he said, like, I think he's also had a heart, uh, a heart failure, a heart, heart attack while like he was having a drug overdose, you know, suffering, like, mixing summer and wine, I don't know. So it's a really darn shame, you know, what, what might have been. It's just like, he died young, you know, it's just what it is, you know. I, I don't know, I don't know about Spicoli, not from the his work. Like I said, I don't really know him, you know, as you know, I don't really, not really, never heard of him before, but I'm um, like, they thought they're going to have this match on on this show, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. You know, he died a week before, you know, so, anyway, uh, uh, let's move on, I'm starting to ramble, so it's just what it, it's just sh pretty shame that a guy who, you know, you know, it's, you know, he had, um, I don't know. I don't think he. I don't think he aim. I don't think he was just kind of there. I don't think he's gonna be like a big star in WCW. He might be like a, like an under mid card, like guy, but not like being like a like a world champion. I don't know. Anyway, so let's move it on to. By the way, on the pre-show, you had not pre-show. In the dark match, you have the Ultimate Dragon defeating Shiryu. Was it Shiryu? It's basically Kaz Hirashi who will be future member of the Young Dragons in WCW in the year 2000 with um, Jimmy Noble under a mask and Jimmy Wan Yang. Anyway, so the first match to kick off the show, we got Rick Martel defending the WCW Television Championship against Booker T. This is the rematch from Sold Out the previous month. Um, and then on the Go Home Show of Nitro, Martel defeated Booker T for the title. Originally, originally it was supposed to be Booker T versus Satin for the TV title, but you know, Martel defeated uh, Booker for the title on the Go Ho Show to the sh to Super Brawl. So this is a gauntlet style match. So the winner of this match, you know, Booker uh, Martel versus Booker T, will face Satin for the title. So. Um, yeah, th this was Rick Martel's combat, you know, he took a, I think he took a break after leaving, you know, for, he took a break from pro wrestling after leaving the World Wrestling Federation in 1995, he came back, his, his first feud back in pro wrestling was Booker T, and um, yeah, he won the title, so, the match between him and Booker T, this was a good match, a really good match, back and forth between Booker T and Rick Martel. Martel never like got an opportunity. I done my research and also I watched Dark Side of the Ring, you know, all about Dino Bravo. He wrestled in Canada, he was respected in Canada. I think he was a big deal in the AWA, but like great stuff in the um in the World Wrestling Federation, he was not really a big deal. You know, he was the model, but he's never like an Intercontinental champion. I don't think he won a tag team. I'm not too sure he won a tag team towel with the company. I don't know. So anyway. So Martel suffered an injury in this match, so Booker T hit the um the hip toss onto Martel, and Martel kind of clipped his leg onto the middle rope. And I'll get to more of Martel a bit later on. So he kind of worked through it, sucked it up, and also he doesn't do anything anymore. You know, in it like in his thinking his later run in went in the end of WCW run, and then when he was in WWE and TNA. I'm talking about Booker T, by the way. He does that, um, you know, in that time period in the mid nineties, you know, when he was part of Holland Heat, you know, he does Booker T does that, oh, that type of um scream or shout, you know, I find it funny in my opinion, you know, he doesn't do it anymore when he was in, you know, I think in the rest of the run of uh, WCW, then in WWE and TNA, he does that, oh, you know, I find it funny, anyway. So in the end, um, Booker hit um, Martel with the Holland sidekick for the win. So I heard, I heard the legends that the original 
finish for this match was possibly uh, Martel retaining the TV title to face Sam, but unfortunately, Sam, you know, Martel got injured. So, moving on to the second TV title match. So, Booker T versus Perry, um, not really Perry Saturn, but just Saturn. So, um, he was representing the flock, and speaking of the flock, the flock was attending this show. You had Raven, it's Stevie Richards, Billy Kingman, um, Van Hammer, Lodi, the sign guy. Lodi is basically, I'm guessing he is the answer to the sign guy, Dudley, in ECW. Anyway, so, yeah, the match between Saturn and Booker for the TV title, it was... Not on the same level as the previous match between Booker and Martel, but um, it was it was a good, still a good match, you know. Um, you know, it was a bit, a little bit boring, but I think it was still a decent, good match, you know. I think like Saturn did like a, a Vader bomb outside the ring of Booker T. In the end, uh, Booker T hit the um the Holland sidekick for the win. And let's get back to Martel. So, like I said, he injured his knee against Booker T in this match on the show. It took it took some few months until he came back in his first match back. He had his had a match with Booker T's brother Stevie Ray, and then he got hurt again. And then he, I think he left WCW. Yeah, he, he left the company, and then he went. I think he's he's a final year as a pro wrestler. You know, he had wrestled in Canada before retired the, the previous year. Uh, not not previous year, but the following year in '99. I'm trying to say, my bad. So. I don't know, I don't know, I think like with Martel, I think he was kind of 42 years old, I don't know, I think he was kind of like running his career down, I think he's like um, Paul Nondor, you know, he was in WCW, he was the TV champion, he was also running his career down, and and then when the Horsemen written off on Nitro, he just basically just quit career, you know, I don't think there'll be world champions, I think he was a bit, mm, I don't know, I think it was just like if he, Debuted years later, years early, like in the early 90s, in late 80s, you know, late 80s, early 90s, you know, maybe. But unfortunately, it's just, has to do with timing, sorry. So, moving on to the next match. So, the next match, we had Disco Inferno taking on the Parker. This was an okay match, to be honest. It wasn't a bad match, but wasn't great. It was boring. I wish they, I think it was a 15-minute match, you know. I wish they cut about four to five minutes off this match, you know. You know, but it was still good for what it is. You know, you had, um, you know, La Parker, who's, I think it was a heel. Yeah, like, when he was came out to the ring, he was trying to threaten to hit a fan with the chair. Um, La Parker hit, like, a court screw moonsault and a, I think it was a suicide down, um, a disco. I almost called him Isco. <laughs> Isco. Anyway, so, here's the end of this match. Trying to keep it short and simple, folks. So, um, I think La Parker placed a chair in the middle in the ring, trying to like hit like a move uh, off the top rope, you know, on the chair. But instead, Disco kind of thrown La Parker off the arm, um, the top rope. He kind of landed it onto the chair. Disco hit the arm, um, the chart breaker. It's basically his version of the stunner for the win. It's funny, like in today's wrestling, in our current timeline, everyone's doing other people's finishers. You know the moves, and including in WWE, but back then, you know, you know the only the only per, the only persons doing the stunner was Stone Cold Steve Austin. You know, you know, Steve Austin got the Stone Cold stunner. This Gonfano got the chart breaker. So the next match, um, this is a bonus match. You know, it was originally yeah, it was replaced the like I said, it was originally it was supposed to be Larry Sabisco versus Louis Spicoli. But, um, like I said, Spicoli passed away a week before the show, so the bonus match you had Brad Armstrong taking on Bill Goldberg. Brad, Brad Armstrong is, I think he's the brother of Rose, uh, Ro, <laughs> Road Dog Jesse James. It's funny, like, his brother, at this, at this current timeline, I think he was a tag team with Billy Gunn, the New Age Outlaws, you know, getting over, or soon to be get over, like, in the spring of that year, so... They're not, we're not quite there yet, the um, New Age Outlaws. Anyway, so, he was wearing, like, the Armstrong Curse t-shirt. I don't know why they did that, you know, maybe the, because all the Armstrongs were in WCW. Brad, and Steve, who was part of the, uh, the Young Pistols with Tracy Smothers, and then, uh, uh, yeah, Road Dog was in WCW. I don't get the whole 
curse thing. Anyway, so the match between Armstrong and Goldberg, it was typical Goldberg's um, streak, you know. It was basically a squash match, I'm trying to say. Because, we're, yeah, it was in the middle of Goldberg's legendary streak. Goldberg was not quite dead yet. He was, you know, I'll, get, I'll talk more about Goldberg shortly after this match. You know, like I said, so typical Goldberg squash match, you know. Hit the, um, was it the Jack Hammer? Yeah, I think it was the Jack, the spear and the Jack Hammer for the win. Goldberg will be super over in the summer of 98, you know, when he defeated Hogan for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship at the Atlanta Dome. And then, yeah, he went on to also win the United States title against Raven. I think it was the, the Nitro after Spring Stampede, you know, when, you know, he got the, um, I think it was in Florida, you know, in the Ravens Wolves match. So, yeah, Goldberg was not, he was not super over, but he's on the right direction, so. So, the next match, this is for the WCW Cruiserweight Championship. This is title versus mask. You got Chris Jericho, the Cruiserweight Champion at the time, defending the belt against, um, uh, against, um, Hoover 2 Guerrero. So, um, Jericho won the Cruiserweight title against Rey Mysterio at, um, sold out the previous month. You know, he was a heel at this moment in time. He was an asshole. He was doing the, calling the fans Jericho Holics. Um, you know, like he's, um, other two reigns as the Cruiserweight uh, Champion was not really getting over. I think he was like lack of character development in his first two runs as the Cruiserweight Champion when they put the belt on him. You can tell that like he, you know, he injured Rey Mysterio's knee at Sold Out, you know, he's an asshole. Like, um, he came out with Break Down the Walls, you know, that is his first theme music when he debuted in the WWF the following year in 1999. He came out, um, uh, yeah, he came out, he kind of ripped a sign, a fan sign says, I am a Jericho holic, you know, he ripped it, said, don't patch night to me. Um, this is, yeah, Tile versus Mask, you know, if Fuvi wins, he keeps the mask and becomes the new Cruiserweight Champion. If he loses, he has to unmask. The match was really good, you know, the soul box of the match, Jericho was wrestling with the tile belt on him, and then Fuvi just kicked him in the gut. Um, really good match, back and forth, good um, cruiserweight style. Jericho was playing possum, you know. He was looking left and right. On, he was laying on the ground outside of the ring. I like that heel Jericho thing, you know. He's starting to get over at the time. Trying to keep it short and simple, folks. Um, it, I think hit like I think Hoovy hit like a uh, a guillotine outside of the ring. You know, typical cruiserweight moves. Jericho also hit some high fly moves as well. Um, in the end, I think Hoovy was going like Hoovy Driver. In the end, Jericho hit the um, the walls of the, locked in the not walls of Jericho, the Lion Tamer onto Hoover to Guerrero to make them tap out. Jericho retains the Cruiserweight title and may and and yeah, Hoovy has the ball to re, yeah, remove his mask. You know, Jericho grabbed the mic. I think he called Hoovy Quasi Juice. Uh, quasi Juice, I say Quasi Juice. What the hell? What, what's going on? So. Yeah, Hoovy was disappointed. He has to unmask himself, and yeah, he's about to. You know, he took it too slow. Jericho was a bit pissed off. He instead of like Hoovy, um, you know, he, he, like short for Hoovy too. So instead of Hoovy too, like removing the mask before by himself, but Jericho basically ripped, ripped the mask off him, and Jer he looks fine. You know, I think he was in his twenties at the time. He aged a age a bit. I don't think he wore a mask ever again, you know, but he probably wore a mask, you know, in the Indies, in Mexico, but not on mainstream pro wrestling, you know, including, like, years later in WWE, him, you know, teaming up with Super Crazy and Psychosis, the Mexicals, he never wore a mask again. I think they did, yeah, next time Jericho get involved in, you know, Tile for this mask match will be a decade later in WWE, it was against, it was against uh, Rey Mysterio at the Bash, you know, the Intercontinental Tile versus Ray's Mass, you know, that's another story for another time. So, I think mean, Hoovy, in the rest of the run in WCW, he ended up doing Midic in the Rocks gimmick, the Juice gimmick. He also also was part of the um, the Filthy Animals with Ray and uh, Disco and um, Hoover, uh, not Hoover, too, uh, Conan and Tigress. That will be in late 99 in that wrestling shit year of WCW in 2000. So, it gave them more character development, you know. It's just like, um, it's just what it is, man. So, 
Jericho went on, I think his first made his first big major feud in the Cruiserweights. Yeah, he fought against Ray and Hoovy, but like his first what big feud was against Dean Malenko. That's another story from another time. You know, marking his dead, dead dad. He's and also we did a, a segment on Nitro with the Thousand and Four Holes. So moving on to the next match. So this was not a good match. You know, um, we got. Yeah, Steve Mongol McMichael taking on the British Bulldog Davy Boy Smith. So this is British Bulldog's first match back in WCW for the first time since 1993. He's, he left in what, 90, what, I think it was 93. He had a he spent what a short time in the UK before coming back to the WWF in 1994. But you know he lasted until 1997. He left the yeah he left the company after. The event in Montreal, beyond you know, the Montreal screw job at Survivor Series in 97. Him, Brett, and Nineheart left the company. You know, it's over protests. Owen stayed with the company. And then uh, Bulldog's first feed back in the company was Mongo. Mongo was a bit, bit pissed off because he hates the wrestlers up north taking his spots. You know, up north reference the WWF. Um, then on paper, you know, Mongo, I see Mongo's matches, I also covered the uh, Mongo Jericho, uh, not Mongo Jericho, Mongo Jeff Jarrett match, you know, he and Mongo Alex Wright at Halloween Havoc, he is not that good in the ring, he is a good personality, a good manager, you know, he's part of the Four Horsemen, but um, he's okay. He's a good manager, good personality, but as a wrestler, he is not that good. On paper, you thought Bulldog, who's a, a good worker, could really carry, carry Mongo to a passable match. Unfortunately, that's not really the case. So, uh, Bulldog locked Mongo with the um, the shot shooter. I get it because he was part of the Hart family. He is married to Brett's sister Diana at the time. Um, it was not that good of a match, and. It, <laughs> Um, I'm gonna get to the end, folks. So Mongo was going for the punch, Bulldog, near the rope, near the ring post. He was trying to punch Bulldog. Bulldog got out of the way the last second, and Mongo broke his hand. So he broke his hand. Bulldog woke on the arm and the ha the injured hand of uh, Mongo, and Bulldog locked in the. I think it was a wrist lock or an arm bar. I think it was an arm bar onto Mongo. I think Mongo basically. I don't think he tapped out. I think he submitted. Bulldog won this match, so yeah, Mongo literally broke his hand in his match with British Bulldog. It was just what it is. He came back in June. I think he left in '99. You know, Bulldog's run in WCW, his second run in the company, was a bit forgettable because his first run, he was in the World Title picture, feeling with Vader. But in his second run, he was not really doing anything. Um, his final match in WCW was at Fall Brawl in September, later on of that year in 98. Um, I think it was a tag team match. It was him and uh, Bulldog and Nineheart taking on, um, I think it was Disco Inferno and Alex Wright, I think. And then he took like a back body drop onto the trap door, the Warriors trap door that set up the War Games match, you know, that broke his back. And then I'll get, I might review Fall Brawl in the future, but. Um, Oh, yeah, it just, yeah, I don't, yeah, you know, because he never was told that there's a, like, um, a trapdoor in the ring, so. So, moving on to, in my opinion, match of the night. In my opinion. We got Diamond Dallas Page defending the WCW United States title against Chris Benoit. They had a match on Thunder weeks prior, but that was ended after, like, it was thrown out after the interference by the flock. I'm guessing they were fuming with the flock at the time. <laughs> yeah, this is before my time, you know. You know, I was like a, a bit, I was like a toddler. This is 1998, I'm 27. This was like almost a quarter of a century, you know. Anyway, the match between DDP and Chris Benoit, this was good. It was a good technical style of match. And also they also made it into like a drag out brawl. They ended up like fighting, throwing punches at each other. I really liked it. It got a little boring with the rest holds. I hate that. You know, it really brings the quality of matches down, in my opinion, doing a lot of rest holds. If you do it once or twice, that'll be fine. But do it every single time, Jesus Christ. <laughs> that will be, nah, that'll be disappointing. So, anyway, so I'm trying to keep it short and simple. In the end, I think, like, um, Benoit was going for, like, a back 
Um, I think he was going for like the crossface, some parts of the maps. Of uh, um, anyway, he was going for like a back, back so was a backslide pin, but instead of DDP because of the heights. I think Ben was about under six foot. DDP is about six three, six four. He was going for like a back body slide. And he looks nearly the same height. You know, he looks nearly the same height as DDP. You know, I know he's, you know, people think he's that short. Ben was. He's about like about six. I say about five eleven. Six feet tall. Anyway, so he was going for like the back body slide, but DDP counted into the diamond cutter for the win. Um, I've got to mention it at the end of the um the two Booker T TV title match against Martel and, and Paris Saturn. Like the TV title was traded back and forth between Booker T and Chris Benoit, and um and then also I think he I think DDP ended up dropping the belt to Raven, and then I think he dropped to Goldberg. Uh, I need to look it up, man. And um, this is set up. This stuff with you know when the when they traded uh, the TV tail back and forth between Booker T and Chris Benoit, it was playing the seeds of the seven match series for the United States tail, I think, with uh, Booker T and Chris Benoit. That'll be later on in the year. I think it was in the summer of '98. So by the way, so DDP went on to he had a good '98. You know, in '97 he had a good '97, a breakout year in '97, being with. Um, Rejecting to join the NWO, feuding with Macho Man Randy Savage, and then winning the United States title. Then in 98, you know, he went on to win the War Games match at Fall Brawl, then went on to challenge Goldberg for the world title at Howen Havoc in October of that year. So, moving on to the final three matches of the show. <sighs> so, yeah, uh, the next match we got Macho Man Randy Savage with... Miss Elizabeth in the corner of the Macho Man taking on Lex Luger. A rematch from Sold Out. I watch a lot, I cover a lot of Randy Savage Lex Luger matches, you know, in 95 and a little bit of 96. You know, I a few Nitros and pay-per-views. You know, the start of the Monday Night Wars era. Um, no chemistry. And this is more focused on Hogan and Randy Savage. Um, I'll get to, I'll get to more of that in the main event, so... Uh, I think uh, Luger was bandaged up. I'm guessing he suffered like a beatdown. I don't know. So I don't really watch the run. I, I, I do my research on it, by the way. <laughs> anyway, so um, the match. Yeah, the match was good. What the fuck I'm saying? <laughs> the match was shit, man. It was a shit match. You know, it was more of a brawl than a match. It was brawl. It was boring. And then the end. You got the NWO guys interfered. You had Vincent. You had Buff Bagwell, you had Scott Norton. When Luger locked in the torture rack, Elizabeth basically, I was it eye gouged Lex Luger's eyes. I mean, at this moment of time, I think Luger and Elizabeth are married at the at, in that time period. Yeah, they got divorced in. I think they stayed. They're married until two thousand three when Elizabeth passed away of that year. You know, it, it, I, it's funny that um, you know. You know, Rant Savage and Elizabeth were married in real life, and then, and then, and then, and then they got divorced, and then Elizabeth went on to marry Lex Luger, and I think Luger, Luger was accused of assaulting Miss Elizabeth. I don't want to get into that; it's another story for another time. So the match was just shit. Um, yes, Luger. It was a disqualification. Luger just in the end locked in the torch right onto Savage. Hogan was there saying you deserve to lose. I'll get to more of the Hogan Savage bit um later on. So moving on to the next match, the semi or the semi or I call it the second to last main event. So or the second last match of the night. I'm trying to say uh, we got the WCW World Tag Team Championship match. We got the Steiners, Rick and Scott Steiner with, I think it was Billionaire Trade or Trillionaire Trade. That is um, Ted DiBiase um, Sr., the Million Dollar Man, in the corner of the Steiners, defending the belts against the Outsiders. That is Scott Hall and Kevin Nash with Dusty Rhodes, who's part of the NWO. Like, uh, the previous month at Sold Out, you know, Dusty Rhodes helped Scott Hall defeat Larry Sabisco in that match at Sold Out, you know, and... To, he was like left the comité er, arena, became like a man a manager, part of the NWO. It was typical NWO shtick, you know, just a heel turn, sick of the heel turn. If you was a heel, you have you have to be part of the NWO. It's just what it is. So, 
So the match, the match between the Steiners and the Outsiders, the, 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 the feud in 1997, it started out sold out of the previous year in 97 when the Steiners defeat the Outsiders for the tag team title belts. Unfortunately, the uh, the net, the, it was on a Saturday, by the way, on the following Monday on Nitro, Bischoff basically give, strip the, uh, the Steiners of the tag team title belts, give back to the Outsiders because of, you know, because Randy Anderson was not an official referee of this match. So yeah, the yeah the Luger and Giant won the tag team titles, and then in the whole bulk is between you know the outsiders of nine nine seven, you know Paul and Nash. Sometimes Six will fill in that spot when Nash is not around. So so on the uh, yeah October episode of of I think it was Nitro, Steiners defeated the Outsiders. Then you know yeah they're trading back and forth for the tag team titles. So this is kind of basically the blow off. The match was more of an angle, yeah, the first bulk of the match was between uh, Rick Steiner and Scott Hall, and then the Steiners did their pose, and then Scott, and then I think like, Scott kind of went to the Outsiders, and Scott basically turned on his brother Rick, axe handled him, and then the match turned into a handicap match. The Outsiders defeated um, Rick Steiner to regain back the um, the WCW Tag Team Towels. Um, you know, this... Way better than the, the Dusty Rose heel turn, that was out of nowhere, but this was good, you know. The heel, th this heel turn of Scott Steiner, you know, he became a big pop of punk. He ended up, like, doing the, the posing, wearing the sunglasses, the tattoo around his arms and his chest. He had that, that crappy chest, you know, that was an operation of an injury from a decade later. You know, in 2007, he ended up saying some crazy shit in... W he didn't really say... Yeah, he doesn't... He says some crazy shit, you know, in shoot interviews and, you know, in TNA and not really much in, the, in his, like, return to WWE. You know, he become... I think it was the United States champion. He become the world champion in the end of WCW's run. So it was a, a really a sensible heel turn for Scott Steiner. Yeah, yeah, the Titan Tower match, it wasn't bad, but at the same time, it was just, you know, it's more about Scott Steiner to the heel than the match itself, so. Moving on to the main event, the rematch from Starcade 1997. Hollywood Hulk Hogan taking on Sting for the vacant WCW World Heavyweight Championship, so. This is the rematch from Starcade. Haven't really seen the match of Starcade. I heard about this match of Starcade. Some people say it was a bad match. So, yeah, it was the match when Nick Patrick fucked up the arm. Uh, the finish, you know, the free count, you know. Anyway, the match was a bit a bit better, you know, but that, that's not saying too much. You know, I watched, I covered, like, their match in TNA. Sting and Hogan never had any good chemistry. They had a, for the, for the, the feud again... In 99, at Halloween Havoc, did the whole finger poke of doom, don't want to get into it. Um, you had Hogan, basically, it's more like a brawl. You know, Hogan choking Sting um, with Sting's jacket. I think they hit him each other with the um, the weightlifting belt. And before that, you had uh, you had this segment later on, in the early of the show, you had uh, basically, you know, the restated Nick Patrick as a referee. Patrick, and then JJ said to Nick Patrick, you're not going to referee the main event, so here's the kicker, you know, there's there's a hint that he's going to um, referee the main event, and he did, he, so yeah, Sting hit like the Stinger Splash, instead of on Hogan, he did it on the, um, the referee Charles Robinson, and then Nick Patrick filling in, instead of helping Hogan win in the match against Sting, he turned babyface for the first time since Halloween Havoc 96, when he turned on, you know, it was a match between Jericho and Six, that's um, X-Pac. So he didn't really, he just clawed down the middle, you know. Every time Hogan, like, do the choke or refused to listen to the referees, like, do that one. When the referee did, like, one, two, three, you know, counts to five, you don't answer for the count five. The match will throw it out to a disqualification. Patrick, you know, like, basically pull Hogan away. Um, so it's just basically... Yeah, it was just whatever, you, you thought he's not, like, I don't know, I don't want to get into it, it's just an, an okay face turn, it wasn't spectacular, um, you know, I prefer Nick Patrick as the heel referee, um, anyway, so, in, I'm trying to keep it in the end, so, in the end, you had, 
Yeah, you, you had Sting hit the multiple Sting Splashes and Hogan hit the Scorpion Death Drop at the same time Hogan low blow Nick Patrick. And then you got the end of real guys interfered. You know, the same guys interfered in the Luger Savage match. Um, this, uh, but uh, here's the backstory. So it's more all between Hogan and Savage. You know, you know, struggling power. This is the the, the armor, of, the NWO armor kind of crack. You know, we'll get more to that um, shortly. Yet Hogan and Savage butt heads. Who's gonna like win the world title, becoming the world champion? You know, Hogan once says, "I'm the only one to win the world title." Savage, you know, was a bit pissed off. You know. Basically, you know, it's the fighting. You can tell, like, it's slowly or the beginning of the end of W of NWO. Anyway, so yeah, Savage hit um, Hogan. I think it's in the head with a spray can. Sting pins uh, Hogan to win the WCW World Title, and afterwards, Sting sprayed WCW in the chest and stomach area of Hogan. Yeah, it's a spin. What the NWO members do to the, the non NWO wrestlers, you know, spraying NWO logo, NWO logo. So I'm stumbling by the way, spraying the NWO logo into their stomach and chest area. Sting doing it, it was a bit sweet. Yeah, it's a bit too little, too late. I wish they did that at Starcade, but just whatever. So Sting went on to hold that belt until dropping it to Randy Savage at Spring Stampede. Like I said, I think Spring Stampede was the first um, pay per view. When Raw, it was after Raw beat Nitro in the 83 week rating streak. So brought that streak. Yet Sting, <laughs> yeah, um, Savage defeat Sting for the for the WCW World Title after the inter interference by the NWO members. And then the following Nitro, Hogan won the title back after the um the help by Bret Hart. Bret turned heel. He was an, uh, not an official member of the NWO, but it was a satellite member. So it's just what it is. So. So my final rating for WCW Super Bowl 8, I give it an 8 out of 10. You know, I don't really give it a 6 or a 7. I give it an 8. I think this is still a strong show. You got some good, but at the same time, had some bad. The only thing in the okay has to be, you know, the La Parker Disco Inferno match. Which they, if they could just cut it down it's 5 minutes, I can really play it in the good. Like, in the, the bad, you had... Mongo versus Bulldog, Luger versus Randy Savage. They had no chemistry. Why they keep doing it? You know, I glad they stop it when they, you know, because they keep being it, being a dead horse to death. And then the main event between Hogan and Sting was just, it was just, it was under, it was just what it is, whatever. It was still a bad match. So, but in the good, you got the good, like, you know, the Titan Tower match. You know, it's just what it is. You got the um, I put the um. Scott Steiner's Hilton in the good. The two um, TV title matches for Booker T against Martel and Saturn, that was good. You know, Booker T did double duty on this show. Um, I like the Cruiserweight title match between um, Chris Jericho and Hulu Guerrero, title versus mass match. And the match of the night for me was the United States title match between Chris Benoit, uh, yeah, DDP versus Chris Benoit for the United States title. Yeah, um... You know, I haven't really seen all the Super Bowls. I heard that this is one of the best. Like I said, I haven't seen it before I like, review, attempt to review this show. The only Super Bowls I review on the channel were Super Bowl 1 and Super Bowl 3. So, I don't know. I think it's in the top tier. Probably in the top tier. I think there's been oh, 10, 9, 10 Super Bowls before the company went under. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah I think it's 9, 10. You know, it started in 2000, uh, 1991, ended in... 2001 a decade so i don't know so i think this was the strongest super brawl you know like i said wasn't a perfect show but wasn't a shit shit sh a shit show but i think it was a strong sh really a strong show overall you know the you know typical wcw pay-per-view sometimes crap main events but at the same time have a a good sh strong undercard so anyway so i hope you enjoyed my review of wcw super brawl 8 Leave your thoughts, concepts below, smash the like button, click the bell, subscribe to the Central Man Network on YouTube. Next time, last year I reviewed the first Super Bowl. Let's go to the following year's Super Bowl. Super Bowl 2, Sting vs. Luger for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. 
This is Essential Man officially signing out. Check you later.